We're all in this together, trying to help each other out here. So I'd like to say thank you to the first Chamber of Commerce webinar, dealing with supporting businesses in a time of crisis. I'd like to really thank uh, HSM for hosting this, this uh, seminar, which deals with various issues relating to redundancies, managing layoffs, negotiating work permit issues, and obviously there'll be a question and answer period. The, what I'm gonna ask you to do, everybody to do really is, is to submit your questions through the chat so that um, in the end of the day, uh, we can track your questions and I assume many of them will be similar. Then uh, Hugh and his team can actually answer those questions um, to the best of their ability over the next uh, hour and a half. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Hugh. And again, great, great thanks to Hugh and his team for agreeing to do this for us. So off to you, Hugh. Okay, thank you, Will. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Hugh Moses. I'm the managing partner of the law firm of HSM. Um, for our sins, we do with a lot of local um, business work, uh, in particular employment and immigration issues. Uh, obviously today we're coming together in uh, less than ideal circumstances and in what can only be described as a national crisis. Um, we are going to give some general um, indications of options that are available to um, employers and indeed indirectly to affected employees. Um, our emphasis is educational. Um, we can't give specific legal advice to start with a negative. Um, each situation is, as you will see when we get into this, very much dependent upon the position of a particular business the, the terms of the contracts it has with its employees. So we're just providing a general overview framework and to the extent we can, we'll try and answer um, specific questions either through the chat or at the end in the Q&A. Um, apologies if I lose you along the way in the explanation. Normally when we're doing these chamber presentations, the audience is much smaller and we're able to take the questions as we're going along, but Zoom really doesn't give us that capability with such a large audience. And uh, I see we uh, have now 119 people on this Zoom chat. So we may be going for a record of the largest number of people gathered together and, um, on a Zoom chat in the Cayman Islands by the time we get to the end of this. But I'm just gonna kick us off. So, trying to turn you all into instant uh, lawyers. When we are looking at this subject, and it is a complicated subject, we need to look at two different factors or two different systems that are in play. The first is the obligations that are employed upon you and your employees um, by the contract of employment that you will have entered into with your employees. That contract obviously has written terms and a breach of those written terms will give rise to claims uh, for breach of contract uh, by either party. Those claims for breach of contract end up in the court system, not the tribunal system. Many of you will be familiar with the labor tribunal uh, and the labor law. What we're talking about here is what we call common law uh, of the islands and the law of contract and those claims will end up in the summary court or the grand court depending on the size of the claim. Under $20,000 we're in the summary court, over $20,000 you're in the grand court. Now um, just jumping ahead to just give you an example, a claim by an employee against an employer to be paid their notice pay or period under their contract would have to be a claim an employee brought in the courts and not before the tribunal because the tribunal has no jurisdiction to make awards in respect of notice pay. Now in contrast, we have our statutory framework and everyone thinks of the labor law, um, but there are a number of other laws, including obviously the immigration laws that affect the employment relationship. 
and breaches of those provisions in the labor law and indeed the immigration law or the gender equality law will end, end up um, in front of other uh, bodies who will then determine those disputes, but specifically the labor tribunal being the most likely to be involved. So you'll hear me jump around a little bit between the obligations under the contract and the obligations in the labor law as we go through this presentation. So, um, to say our phones have been ringing off the hook would not be an exaggeration. There are many, many questions that are being asked. Uh, they, I put a few of them down on this slide uh, first thing this morning. Uh, can I require my staff to take vacation? Can I require my staff to take sick leave? How do I or can I reduce the hours or days my staff work uh, because either I don't have the work for them or I simply can't afford to pay them because my income has dropped. Reducing my staff in levels generally, how do I go about doing that? Can I do it? And do I have to continue to pay health insurance and pensions? And in what circumstances do I have to do that? Am I going to get compensated by the government who forced me to close my business? And can I stop paying my staff or reduce their pay? I mean, that's just a sample. I'm sure all of you on this call have many, many questions. We're going to try and answer indirectly as many as we can uh, based on commonly asked questions of us and an overview of the legislative framework. And let's say at the end of this, hopefully we can deal with as many questions that come up along the way. Solutions. Um, no point telling you all what the problems are. You probably have already discovered all of the problems that you have on day to day now trying to run your businesses. We've gone through the 24 seven curfew. We're now at the stay at home regime, which is still very restrictive and rightly so uh, in the present circumstances. Unfortunately, as business owners and operators, uh, that has a significant impact on us. And the Premier has recently, uh, has recognized that impact. Um, but the emphasis uh, the government is placing at the moment is on preservation of lives and quite rightly so. We're left uh, at this point in time trying to do what we can to get through this. So what can we do as, as employers? And this, I say, is a very employer-related uh, emphasis on this, mainly because chamber members tend to be employers. But redundancy is an option. It's a pretty draconian option because it ends up with you terminating the relationship with your employee. Temporary laying off of a member of staff, and we'll come to that, and the current restrictions and, uh, on the use of that um, provision in the labor law. And then there's reaching an agreement between yourself and an employee, whereby you vary the current terms of your contract of employment, but do it in such a way that you don't end up in breach of that original contract and you don't end up breaching provisions of the labor law. So they're the three main things we're going to talk about. They are also th um, going to talk about the immigration impact on undertaking those different solutions. Um, and uh, on that note, I will move swiftly on to the next slide. So we're gonna take a deep dive uh, into redundancy. Now redundancy occurs and is defined in the labor law as a situation in which by virtue of a lack of customers or orders, retrenchment, the installation of labor-saving machi machinery, an employer going out of business, force mayor, which is a legal concept of effectively an inter uh, outside interruption of the business, or any other reason, tasks which a person was last employed to perform no longer exist. So, COVID-19, uh, the situation we are in, some businesses are completely closed, some businesses are still operating uh, or are trying to operate by working at home, some are still open under emergency powers, some need less staff, some need more staff, but 
If you are one of those businesses who by virtue of a lack of customers or orders, um, you have people who the tasks which they were doing no longer exist for them to do. Redundancy is an option for you under the labor law. The implementation of redundancy has to be done in a particular way or you risk the possibility of unfairly dismissing an employee and we'll come to that as we go through this. Um, what the labor law does however provide at the outset is the basic principle that if you make someone redundant that is a legitimate or fair dismissal. So unfair dismissal does not normally arise when you make somebody redundant. And when you make somebody redundant, as we will see in a moment, your principal obligations are going to be in relation to notice periods and severance pay. However, the labor law does say that even when you make somebody redundant, you have to have acted reasonably. And the statute contains the test of what is reasonable. And it rather unhelpfully or in very general terms says that one has to take into account what's equitable, the merits of the particular situation and have regard to all of the circumstances. Now I would put it to you that in the great majority of cases, 99% of the cases, if you make somebody redundant because they no longer have a task to perform for your business, you're going to have acted reasonably under the terms of the labor law. And therefore the question of unfair dismissal simply will not arise. Now here's the trap. Uh, first of all, it has to be a true redundancy. Um, the mere fact that you didn't get on with a particular employee uh, this is not the time to use the excuse of making them redundant ha without going through what you would normally have, have to have gone through, which is the process of warning people for poor performance or misconduct. If, if that is the situation, you should not be using the redundancy regime. If you do misuse the redundancy because there aren't the circumstances giving rise to the redundancy, then you will have unfairly dismissed that employee. Um, the more likely scenario though, is you get caught in the trap that you have more than one employee that you are making redundant and they work in the same or a very similar position. So for example, you have four people who work in your business as um, delivery drivers, you're no longer able to operate your business, not a restaurant, uh, you have nothing to deliver. Therefore you decide that you are going to make all your delivery drivers redundant. And then the, you have to apply a test set out uh, in the law, which requires you to consider the immigration status of the people you are laying off. So go back to the example of the four delivery drivers. If you decide you're only going to lay off three of them, you're going to have to lay off those delivery drivers that are on work permits or RPR holders or uh, before you get to the delivery driver who is Caymanian. In other words, the Caymanians are the last resort in terms of termination by way of redundancy. And if you don't follow that protocol, um, then you're going to have unfairly dismissed the particular delivery driver. So if you're getting rid of all your delivery drivers, the problem simply doesn't arise. But because you have to look at the position and the work that they are carrying out and group your employees into those groups as you decide who, unfortunately, you consider you have to make redundant in order to preserve your business. Or worst case, you're going completely out of business and you're just getting rid of all of your employees. So make sure you don't get caught in the unfair dismissal trap when exercising your rights to make people redundant under the labor law and following that process. So this is the preference order that needs to be followed 
Um, work permit holders are expected to be made redundant before permanent residents. Permanent residents are expected to be made redundant before the spouse of a commandian holding a residency and employment rights certificate. And commandians are expected by law to be the last to face redundancy. But as I've just said, entirely academic if you are getting rid of all of your employees or all of the employees who are doing the same type of work. Um, and given that the redundancy is a form of termination of contract, what you're then going to do is have to deal with the legal requirements of what you pay an employee when you make them redundant. We'll just come on to that next. Now, there is a provision in the labor law which we're going to deal with and was one of those three things mentioned on one of the earlier slides, which is layoffs layoffs or temporary terminations. Now, temporary terminations and layoffs trigger different things than a permanent redundancy. So when you have a permanent redundancy, i.e. you're making the person redundant, you're ending the employment relationship. In those circumstances, you have to pay severance pay. And you have to pay that severance pay at the time in which you are terminating the employee. In contrast, in the layoff regime, the severance pay is deferred, and we'll come back and look at that in more detail um, on a later slide. So just touching on the layoff provisions, so it's clearly understood that there's a difference between redundancy and layoff. Layoff under Section 42.2 of the Labour Law gives an alternative which for certain employers may work, um, which enables you to lay off a worker for a period in effect not exceeding 21, sorry, 29 days. You'll see 30 days in the actual legislation. But what the legislation says is that if you lay off somebody for 30 days or more, then you are potentially going to tr trigger the severance requirement. So you can lay off somebody for 29 consecutive days, not pay them, but on day 30, you have to recall them to employment. And our recommendation is if you're doing a layoff, you put the date of recall so there's no doubt. That's the date in which the normal employment relationship resumes and you're back obligated to pay your employee. It's a 29 day period in which you potentially um, can exercise this position and not pay your employees for 29 days. Obviously, if you're in a position to pay them or pay them something, that's entirely a matter for you. But the layoff provisions do enable you to do that. However, remember, they remain your employees. You've not made them redundant. So during this period, they are still your employees. They are still required to have work permits if they are on work permits that are valid work permits that have been renewed, etc. And you are still required to maintain health insurance for those employees and pay up to 50% of the premium for those employees even though they're not working because you've laid them off for the 29 days. So it's a short-term provision, which some people have already exercised, some people have not. Um, the real problem is that your guess is as good as mine as to whether the world in the Cayman Islands is going to return to any degree of normality in terms of your particular business within that 29-day period. If it's not going to, this may be of only very limited value or use to you. It's pushing some harder decisions further down the line um, because ultimately you, at the end of this period, you're going to have to again re-engage with your employee and decide what you're going to do. And again, we'll come back to really what those options are other than redundancy, which really is um, other than an agreement with your employee uh, where you're going to end up. Um, unfortunately, it looks right now that we are in for a 29-day-plus stretch. Um, so you need to think that through in deciding whether to put into play this option or not. 
Um, now, on an immigration standpoint, um, it's unclear whether the temporary layoff uh, in relation to work permits, what, what really happens in that situation. We believe that it does not trigger an obligation to inform immigration that you've laid off that work permit holder. Um, the law is masterfully unclear as to what your obligations are in this respect, but I think in the present situation, the last thing the immigration department is going to want to have is hundreds of letters telling them that hundreds if not thousands of people have been laid off. There is, however, a very clear obligation in Regulation 9 of the Immigration Regulations that says where a person whose employment in the islands is authorised under a work permit, the grant of which is conditional upon his remaining in the employment of a particular employer, ceases to be employed by that employer, then automatically the work permit ceases to be valid and you as an employer are required to notify the chief immigration officer. And if you do not do that, um, that is an offense, which can on conviction result in a fine and, and of uh, up to $5,000. So if you make someone redundant, you must notify the immigration department of that fact if they are a work permit holder immediately upon doing so. If you lay someone off, and you lay them off only for the 29 days permitted under Section 42, our current view is that there is no written obligation in the law anyway that we can see that says that you have to write into immigration and tell them that you've done that. So severance pay, that's the first thing you're going to have to pay if it is a redundancy. This does not apply in relation to a layoff unless you fail to recall the employee, in which case it automatically sort of converts into a redundancy. But if you're just simply laying them off, then you don't have to worry about this. If you've decided to make them redundant, sever the employment relationship, then you're going to have to pay severance pay. And severance pay is calculated as being one week's pay at the latest basic wage for each completed year of service. So you look at the start date of employment, you look at where you are now, how many years have elapsed, how many of those years are completed, what is your employee's basic wage, and you are obliged to pay them three weeks if they have completed, for argument's sake, three weeks of uh, employment with you. Basic wage is defined and it specifically does not include things like gratuities and commissions. It's the basic salary that's set out in the contract of employment. And anybody who has done one year or more of service gets this award. If they've done less than one year of service with you as an employee, they will not be entitled to severance pay. So you would be able to make them redundant not have to pay them severance pay. But if they've been with you for more than a year, you are obliged to pay severance pay and you're obliged to pay it on termination. So severance pay is due on the termination by the employer for any reason other than poor performance after you've given them a written warning, serious misconduct such as justifies instant dismissal, and misconduct following a written warning. So all the normal provisions whereby you get rid of employees because of poor performance or misconduct, those obviate the need to pay severance, but you will have to have gone through those proper processes, if I can call them that, under the labor law. You can't just decide now today that someone's had poor performance and therefore you're going to make them redundant, you're still going to be liable to pay the termination pay, sorry, the severance pay, because you haven't gone through the process of giving them a written warning for poor performance, allowed them time to improve their performance, and then determined that they haven't, and then terminated them. So we're really dealing with severance pay in the context of a redundancy. In the context of a redundancy, it's an automatic obligation to pay it if they've been with you for more than a year, and one week's pay for every year they have been with you. 
And for some businesses where they would have had employees for very long periods of time, this can be quite a substantial financial obligation that you face. And I would urge all employers for reasons which you're going to see later on in the slides to start getting their calculators out and work out what would happen in the doomsday scenario that they actually had to close their doors. What would be their obligations to their staff financially? Um, but we'll come back to that in a, in a little while. So how do you calculate it? Uh, well, I think I've sort of been through this. It's the basic pay. Um, if there's no contract, you look at what you've been paying. Um, hopefully you have contracts of all your employees because this is really the kind of situation where you really do need to have them. Um, one week's wage for each year of service at the basic wage due immediately, but importantly, right at the end there, not pensionable. So don't deduct pension contributions from that, this payment when you pay the severance to your employee. And you do not need to contribute your 5% into their pension fund either. It is completely neutral for the purposes of pension. Now, this slide is a tad complicated. And I really think if you get involved into these scenarios, you probably ought to ring your friendly local lawyer um, who will probably be involved in any event uh, as a result of what, because what we're really dealing with here is first of all, the situation um, where somebody is, rec is recalled from a layoff situation, but past their 30 days and then they're considered a new employee for severance purposes because you've had to have paid out their severance effectively when you went over the 30-day threshold. However, what is quite likely to happen in, out there in our community is the business owners may get together and go, I can't do this alone. Uh, why are we competing in this environment? Let's get together. Um, let's merge our businesses uh, or let me buy out your business um, and those kinds of arrangements, either buying the shares of a company, uh, going into partnership with somebody or simply buying their business that isn't um, carried on in the form of a company. I'm sure there's going to be many situations like this. And when that happens, there are very specific requirements about what happens to the obligation to pay severance pay. So if you do any and all of any of those wonderful things, then you need to reach an agreement with the person you are entering into your business relationship with as to who has that obligation to pay that built up severance pay. Don't, don't go taking over a business where, you know, has six employees who've been there 20 years um, and then have to fail and have to pay them out because you're going to find that that obligation to pay that severance pay may have transferred to your business. So be careful about that if you're out there and feeling the only way forward is to either fold up your tent and sell it to somebody else or to acquire somebody else's tent or to merge the businesses, those kind of considerations. Be careful about build up liability to pay benefits in the labor law. Notice pay. So we talked about severance pay. Notice pay is the other potential um, big ticket item that you may have to pay out to an employee in terms of dollars when you make them redundant. First of all, notice pay is going to be determined by the period of notice specified in the contract of employment. So for salaried staff, that's quite often a month. For um, hourly pay workers, they may be paid twice a month. But whatever the notice period is in the contract is going to prevail. If there is no notice period in the contract, then you look to the labor law. And the labor law tells us that it's the pay interval. So if you pay everyone every, every two weeks and the contract is silent on notice, then you're going to have to pay them two weeks notice pay when you get rid of them, unless you give them two weeks advance notice of your intent to make them redundant. So if today you say to your worker, 
I'm terribly sorry. It's all looking very grim. I don't, I'm, I can pay you for another two weeks, but that's it. You give them a formal notice of redundancy saying, I am making you redundant in two weeks time. And this also serves as your notice period. Very important to say both things because you have to give notice for the notice period. If you don't, and you just go, you are redundant, sorry, you will have to pay out that two weeks pay when you make them redundant. Now, from a practical point of view, many employers, when they do make people redundant in normal circumstances, will pay out the notice period simply because they don't want the employees still in their business being potentially disruptive, accessing computer systems or whatever it might be that would make you uncomfortable when you know that employee is now leaving your business because you've made them redundant. In the present situation, you'll just have to weigh that up on an individual basis. Can you give the notice, pay them obviously in the normal way during that notice period and then when it comes to the redundancy, you'll only have to pay them the severance pay but that is only if you have given them that advance notice of the termination of their employment. If you don't, you're gonna to have to pay both at the point of actual redundancy. Hope that made sense. Now, here's a, a worked example. Um, an employee is made redundant on the 31st of March, who's worked for three years and two months, is paid $6 an hour, at for their basic pay, has a guarantee of a 40 hour week uh, and is actually paid monthly that salary and has 10 day annual vacation entitlement but so far has not taken any vacation this year. So that person ends up with three weeks severance because they've been employed for three complete years. So three weeks pay by way of severance one month's notice pay, because in this example, we haven't asked the employee to work through their notice. We simply told them out of the blue that they are redundant and they're no longer required to come to work and we are paying out the notice period of one month and it's one month because that is the pay interval. And then finally, they're leaving on the 31st of March. So they've been with the company a third of the year. So they, they're going to accrue, um, sorry, a quarter of the year. <laughs> so they're going to accrue 25% um, of their vacation days, which are 10. So they have 2.5 vacation days that also need to be paid out. So in this particular situation, the employee, when getting the very bad news, is going to get a check for CI $1,880. And that has to be paid at the point of redundancy. Um, and if you were not to pay that, then the employee would be able to troop off to the court and uh, request the, the, that pay, most of that payment and to the labor tribunal on the basis that you had refused or wrongly not paid severance pay. So the employee would have to go two places to get their remedy, which is unfortunate. We've campaigned for a long time for the jurisdiction of the tribunal to be extended to include claims in respect of under the contract of employment. But at the moment, they would have to go to two different places to get a remedy. So pensions law. Um, once you've made somebody retire, once you've made somebody redundant for whatever reason, the employment has ceased. Whether, they've whether that's because they've just retired or whether because you've made them redundant. Um, the redundancy, the severance payments, as we already mentioned, are not pensionable. But there's no ability to take out pension payments simply because you are of itself unemployed unless you have paid in what are called additional voluntary contributions on top of the 10% uh, required payments. Um, pensions really doesn't come into our COVID-19 scenario that much other than to just simply say you don't pay it on the severance payment, but you do of course pay it on final salary 
payments and other accrued ob uh, contractual obligations like the unpaid vacation time that's accrued. Health insurance. Um, everyone should have health insurance. Um, but we know, in fact, there are lacunas out there. There are, unfortunately, unscrupulous employers who uh, are not providing the health coverage they should be providing at 50% at least of their expense. That unfortunately does exist. Um, but on termination of employment, this is where you now have a new, uh, a, a, another obligation to consider, which is under the health insurance law, you are required to maintain your health insurance for your employee for three months following the first of the month after their termination. So the problem here is that although the law provides that that should be done at the expense of the employee, 100% of the expense of the employee, you still have, because the law uses the word shall, the obligation to put that health insurance in place. And it's not just on the employee, it's on any of their dependents that would are also required to be covered and in respect to which you may now be making deductions from their salary in respect of that coverage where those dependents are on your employee's health insurance. Now, when, from a practical point of view, um, those health insurance premiums may actually exceed the amount that you are due to pay your employee on termination. Or they may, if you deduct it from the final payment to the employee, significantly reduce the amount of money that you are going to be giving the employee because you're going to be spending, in effect, their money out of that payment to continue their health insurance. Now, We've seen different limbs of government taking different views on this subject. We've had clients who have been advised that they do not need to deduct the money if the employee does not wish them to do so. Um, and that's all okay. But our view on the law is no, it is not okay. And you are exposing yourself to a tremendous risk. You must, because the law says shall, continue this insurance at least until the point in time when you can be satisfied that the employee is either employed elsewhere and compulsory insured in the Cayman Islands as a consequence, has left the Cayman Islands, and we all know that the issues about how an earth an employee is going to leave the Cayman Islands as matters stand at the moment. Um, so unless you know that, or they've gone off and, for example, got their own health insurance um, during that three month period. Once you have that evidence that they've left or they have cover somewhere else for whatever reason, you can then terminate your health insurance at the end of the month following. And to the extent that you're now no longer required to pay part or all of that health insurance premiums to your health insurer, you are then obliged to return those premiums back to the employee because that's money they ought to have received on termination and which you only withheld because of your obligation to maintain their health insurance. So again, a little complicated, but the thing you really have to bear in mind here is what's the risk? You may feel very sympathetic to your employee and very reluctant to deduct from anything you're paying them on termination, health insurance premiums. But if you don't and you and or you do not maintain that health and they become seriously ill for some reason or involved in an accident, then under the health insurance law, you can become personally liable to pay for those medical expenses. So the risk is very significant to you if you do not maintain that health insurance, even against the wishes of the employee, because you're legally obliged to do so. So bad news there, I'm afraid. So I guess so far, not being too impressed by all the things we've been talking about. They, have, they don't actually 
help that much because at the end of the day, any somebody redundant is going to cost you money, sever your relationship, give you difficulty when the world starts back up again, finding new staff. Um, and we all have personal relationships with our employees that we feel very reluctant to sever. Layoff works, but it only works to a very limited extent. It gives some limited relief to the employer. It gives no relief whatsoever to the employee other than maintenance of their health insurance and knowing that they have a job at the end of it in 29 days time, if in fact, the world has straightened itself out or our world has straightened itself out within that time scale. So none of it is particularly attractive. There is one other last ditch potential solution, which can, and I'm sure will be, and there's nothing I or anybody else can really do about this, could potentially be exploited by unscrupulous employers. But it is perfectly possible to sit down, and I use those words in a virtual environment, emailing, Zooming, whatever it's going to be, reach out to your employee and basically come to an arrangement whereby, as I describe it, you share the pain. Now, it's entirely a matter for you how honest and direct you are with your employees. The employee, it may be obvious to the employee that your income has gone from, you know, for argument's sake, in a small business, $25,000 a month to zero. That may be completely obvious to the employee, and it may be completely obvious to the employee that you have no alternative. You have to cut some of your overheads. You can live on some of your previously earned profits for a while if, if you can, but there comes a point where the pain has to be shared in all of the circumstances because your alternatives are shutting up shop, severing relationships with your employees. So there's nothing to stop you sitting down with your employee and saying, my, you know, my income's dropped 50%, I need to cut your salary by 50%. I, I, I will, in those circumstances, you'll still be my employee. I'll still have to pay and deal with your health insurance. I'll still have to make the pension contributions. But I need you to agree with me that you are either going to be reducing your hours, reducing the days you work, reducing your pay, uh, and you agree that with me. Now, there may be some immigration consequences in relation to that for people on work permits, and there may be a desire or it may be advisable to notify immigration authorities if, for example, you are substantially changing the employment terms that you told immigration these people were going to be on when you got their work permit. But the point is, it's a consensual agreement. The problem with this is the employer has a huge bargaining power position and unscrupulous employers may exploit this. Um, the other risk is that you reach out to your employee and you say, if you don't agree to this, and this may in fact be the true position, if you don't agree to this revised arrangement, I'm going to have to make you redundant and you're going to lose your job and ultimately you'll lose your health insurance and you'll be in the Cayman Islands and ultimately you're going to fall into the category of people who potentially end up unable to pay their rent, unable to afford the cost of food, etc., subject to actions which we know the government are anxiously considering and taking already in relation to these sorts of issues. But there is a risk that the employee says, so what you're telling me is basically, if I don't agree to this, you're going to fire me. And instead of entering into this discussion in a uh, in the spirit in which it, the approach was made, the employee turns around and says, well, you have constructively dismissed me. You can forget it. I'm going to go and work for X instead because they've offered me a job. You've constructively dismissed me because you threatened to fire me if I don't agree to something which involves a substantial change in the terms of my employment. That could end you up in a whole heap of problems. However, 
it may actually be the only thing you can do is to reach out to your employees, trust them, have a full and proper discussion about preservation of their jobs and preservation of your business and reaching a compromise whereby they do take same reduction in their pay in some way. Um, but you continue on commitment to, pay, to keep them employed, pay their work permit, pay their health insurance, pay their pensions. Um, there's also the risk that at some later point, having already signed up to the agreement, they say, well, there was undue influence in the relationship and the agreement's not binding on them. So the real question is, you know, what is it reasonable for you to ask, of, um, to ask as an employer? And the answer to that is going to depend so much on what the nature of the business is, what the impact on the business has been, your own financial situation in the business. Uh, uh, to what extent can you continue to trade in, in these circumstances? But whatever else you do, if you do reach one of these agreements, and uh, we, we've been working with many employers trying to address these, ex these exact issues, make sure the agreement is in writing, Make sure there is clear written evidence of the acceptance of the new arrangement, because obviously the employee is not going to be walking into your office and signing on the bottom line of a new contract of employment. And consider what the other more wider implications are of what you are doing. Um, and the impact generally on your business if you don't do it, and the impact on your business if you do do it. It's a judgment call. Um, there are plenty of professionals out there to help, but it's not an easy course to tread. It may, for those people who either are doing layoffs or are now starting to do them, because many people have been paid up to the 31st of March in any event on their March payrolls, you're going to have to take action now, one way or the other, if you can't afford to keep all these staff in their present arrangement. So, remember the can I's. Can I require staff to take vacation? Answer, no. You cannot force your staff to take vacation, even paid vacation. It may actually be in their best interest, but you simply can't afford to, you cannot force them to do that if they do not wish to do that. So you can invite your staff to take vacation, and if they agree to do so, you can continue to pay them their vacation pay. And obviously in your discretion, you can pay vacation that has not yet been accrued. And you can make it very clear to the staff that in the event that you pay out vacation that is not yet accrued, and later in the year when things are returned to normal, they want to go on vacation, then A, that's going to be in your discretion because they've already taken their vacation, and B, that vacation may well be unpaid because they've already received all of their paid vacation. But in any event, most employees do not have three months worth of vacation that's going to get them through the present situation that we are faced with. We do not know how long this is going to go on. It could go on for months. It could certainly go on for weeks. And most employees are simply not going to have enough vacation in any event. So you're then going to be into either the layoff or the redundancy regime or the agreement regime. Require staff to take sick leave. No, 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 no. First of all, unless they're actually sick, there's no obligation to pay them the sick leave. If you think you're just giving them their sick leave when they're not sick, because that then means that later on in the year when they're sick, you won't have to pay them. Uh, I've got bad news. You are going to have to pay them when later in the year they are sick and produce their sick notes because it's a statutory entitlement. You cannot contract out. You can't change the law of the Cayman Islands by agreeing with your employee that the law is going to be something different. So I've heard of many businesses who are saying, okay, you've got two weeks vacation, you've got 10 days sick leave, now this is 20 days. So go home, 
I know you can't work from home. I'll pay you for the next 20 days, but, and then everything will be normal again. And, and uh, you'll have been paid fully throughout the period. That does not work. Um, reduce my staffing levels. Yes, of course you can. Uh, but you have to do it by way of redundancy, by way of layoff, or by agreement. Do I have to continue to pay health insurance and pensions? Yes, absolutely, if the employee remains an employee. It doesn't matter that you're not paying them, they're still an employee. So whatever arrangement you reach with an employee, to, they're still going to be entitled to their health insurance and their pension on whatever you do ultimately pay them. Can I get compensation from government who in effect forced me to close the doors of my business? Answer, no. As a matter of law, it's highly unlikely that any such claim could possibly succeed in due course against the government. Um, yes, there's a possibility down the line the government may introduce various um, plans that will alleviate the financial impact on businesses. But we don't know what they are going to be at this point in time. And their clear priority is maintaining the flow of income to those people who are already, or before all this started, were already uh, receiving financial support from the government. There's a couple of new things that have been introduced uh, quite rightly and properly of helping certain types of employees with some limited cash handouts. But that's not going to help you as a business. And there are many thousands of people who are not going to necessarily benefit from anything that's been introduced so far. You are on your own to a very large degree. Can I stop paying my staff or reduce their pay? Well, we've been through some of those options. The answer is and rather unhelpfully, maybe. Maybe because of redundancy, maybe because of layoffs, maybe because you would reach some agreement with them that's different. So at this point, I think I'm going to stop talking and give my throat a rest for a few minutes. And hopefully my partner and colleague, Nick Joseph, who is uh, just to introduce him and obviously he can't say it himself, but he's certainly uh, the island's leading expert in the field of immigration law, I think is going to walk us through the next couple of slides. Nick? Or Will, can you make sure Nick's unmuted? Uh, I think that now has fixed it. Uh, good morning, all, and thank you very much, Hugh. Um, of course, everything that Hugh has uh, said has to be looked at through the lens of the immigration regime uh, in the United work for colleagues that are helping KMAT, it has uh, to date been, uh, are off here to various types of immigration permission. And the first thing to bear in mind is that the law continues as it always has. Everything has to be looked at, everything that Hugh has just mentioned, needs to be looked at through the lens of the immigration law and or the immigration transition law as it is now and the role played by work and by customs and border control in implementing those requirements. This is all in a state of quite considerable flux. The government is responding very well to the pressures that are upon them and indeed upon the entire community, but there has to be a prioritization and saving lives is clearly uh, that uh, which uh, has been placed at the forefront as well it should be. But that does not mean that everything else is not still there and an issue for, uh, for others to consider. The immigration laws of the Cayman Islands started out in 1971 in their, in their current iteration effectively as a means of protecting the Cayman Islands generally. That does not just mean protecting Caymanians, it includes protecting Caymanian businesses. But there is that prioritization that you in relation to 
these provisions continue in at the moment. The government responded and provided for some of technical requirements very promptly. So, for example, at the moment, nobody is calling for an up-to-date medical uh, for the uh, renewal of a work permit, and nobody is requiring an actual police clearance certificate to be produced as part of the documentation uh, required to be produced, although there is an expectation that people will show that they have paid uh, for uh, the, uh, the police clearance certificate and have ordered it online. But as we uh, deal with all of uh, these issues, we have to acknowledge that the basic framework still exists. And uh, although it may be subject chain, we understand that there are various uh, things being done in the background to help uh, with that and to adjust to the circumstances that we face, they are not yet in place. One of the immediate implications for that is to recognize that as the requirements on businesses are changing so quickly and that people are quite rightly finding opportunities that maybe they may be able to deploy staff uh, towards, they do have to bear in mind that there is still a restriction in the immigration law on maintaining the current occupation. That does mean people have to continue to play the role that they have been employed and approved to play. This will create tremendous difficulty in certain instances, including in particular, I would use the example of wait staff, who uh, whilst the restaurant may still have its kitchen operating, uh, the question arises, are they able to go and deliver food on the road? Is that something that is considered to be outside the terms and conditions of their work permit? are the work authorities going to ask themselves the question, is that a role that an unemployed Caymanian or permanent resident or spouse of a Caymanian ought to be fulfilling in the circumstances? Now, we know these people in the immigration uh, department in, in work. They are compassionate, decent, hardworking people who are not going to be seeking uh, to be obstructive in any way and who will take a pragmatic and compassionate approach. But the law will be there as their guide, and we need to recognize uh, that they uh, have to view things in that light. There will also be a corresponding issue in relation to trade and business licensing. There is, at the moment, no indication that I have seen that the requirements as to being licensed for the business that it needs to be uh, that is being operated uh, have in any way been waived and so if you find yourself offering a service to which you have not been licensed previously we urge you to endeavor to get a new trade and business license through the department of commerce Ministry, who have been very responsive in recent times granting licenses within days of application similarly the immigration uh, authorities were uh, only even a week ago, were granting urgent express temporary work permits within mere hours of application being made. And uh, I, I believe they are committed to do all they can to accommodate the requests that are put before them. Putting requests before them at this time will, however, uh, have its own challenges. Their offices, as many of ours, uh, are closed. Uh, they are working remotely. We have taken the view as attorneys that people have to do the best they can and that that ought to be sufficient in the environment in which we are all operating unless and until some clear guidance uh, can be issued as to an alternative way forward. And so it is that we are suggesting that if a work permit needs to be renewed, that if a uh, person who is married to a Caymanian needs to make an application for a residency and employment rights certificate before that work permit expires, that the employers or the individuals, as the case may be, proceed to make those applications as timorously as possible in order that they can demonstrate that they did their utmost to comply with the law. That will often be simply filing 
uh, a, a scanned copy of the documentation by email email address and in our view undertaking as to uh, pay fees as soon as possible or as soon as an online payment system becomes available uh, ought to suffice and protect everybody's ongoing interests. Uh, we yet uh, are yet to see what the proposals are in relation to the wider impact of the inevitable large numbers of persons who are without gainful employment. Uh, Hugh has uh, confirmed the Regulation 9 provision will apply the moment a employment is terminated for any reason. If the person is on a work permit, then Workforce Opportunity and Residence Cayman must be notified forthwith. There is also a, a different section of the law that relates to persons who have permanent residence with the right to work under Section 37 of the law, that is the eight-year PR as it's commonly known, employers of those persons must immediately notify the immigration authorities in the event that the employment of such a person is terminated, as indeed must the person themselves. Uh, there is uh, also, of course, the question of people needing to change employers. That is still prohibited. Uh, you cannot work if you are an expatriate on a work permit for an employer other than that for which you have an approved work permit, but uh, applications can be made under section 64 of the Immigration Transitions Law to allow uh, that uh, a transition in employment to take place. We are hearing, although we do not have confirmation, that for immediate, that uh, advertising for renewals may not be being required but I do expect that there will be some need for an employer to demonstrate in asking for the renewal what, that there is no known local person uh, who is uh, not on a work permit uh, available to fulfill the role. How, how tightly that is scrutinized uh, is yet to be seen, but we are very much fans of providing the authorities with full disclosure and complying with the requirements and expectations as widely as possible. Now, I, uh, I know that there is a PowerPoint uh, that uh, is underway. For whatever reason, I'm see having technical difficulties and uh, can't see it at the moment, but I think that covers uh, the, the gist of it. Of course, there are questions that I can see being asked on the Zoom group chat uh, that my colleague Alistair and my colleague Hillary are responding to and of course uh, will be addressing questions that we can uh, during the, the remainder of this session. Nick, perhaps you'd like to just touch on the repatriation? Yes, uh, thank you for that reminder, Hugh. It's a very difficult subject um, and it's one without any clear answers. Uh, employers have been required for many years to pay a repatriation fee as part of acquiring the first work permit for any foreign national. Uh, the amount in recent times has been $1,000. There was a time in the past where that money was kept in reserve, uh, but has uh, for many, many years now simply been uh, consumed by uh, general revenue and put to, to work. Uh, by the government of the Cayman Islands. There is, um, of course, a pressing need for many people be, to be able to travel, even if they had the money to be able to buy the tickets. The reality is no uh, airfares, uh, no airfares can be purchased at the moment. The airports are closed. We don't know when regularly scheduled traffic will recommence. There is obviously an imminent opportunity for people who uh, desire to go to the United Kingdom and perhaps onward from there to other countries. Uh, but that's a very long way to go to perhaps get to your native Honduras or even to Canada. Um, and so against that background, the government has been working uh, quite hard to find a solution uh, and to work ideally with the private sector uh, in, in achieving that. Uh, there is perhaps uh, for those that can afford moral responsibility 
to assist your employees in getting home as the private sector, but there is certainly no legal obligation that uh, I am aware of. Thank you, Nick. I'm just going to um, bring up one more slide before we open up the floor um, to questions. Um, this presentation is primarily about employment and immigration issues arising out of COVID-19. However, I think it would be remiss not to literally spend two minutes on some things that might just trigger some thought patterns uh, amongst the audience. First of all, check in insurance policies and their applicability to your business. The most obvious being if you have business continuity insurance that could potentially assist you financially in a situation where you have to close your offices. Um, other insurance issues can arise where, for example, you have clauses in your property insurance that say if your property insurance remains vacant for more than X number of days, the policy either lapses or only then covers certain types of risks. So you need to look at any and all insurance policies you have uh, and make that part of your checklist of things to do while you're sitting at home watching the TV. <laughs> Um, insolvency, this is the one that might perhaps might break you into a cold sweat and concern you, but you do have to have regard to the fact that you can, in certain circumstances, become personally liable, even in a corporate scenario, um, in the event that you're trading while you're insolvent, um, or if you're not a company, in a scenario whereby, of course, you could end up bankrupt if you're not able to meet your liabilities that you have, including the liabilities that we've been talking about today. Health insurance risk we touched upon, it simply isn't worth uh, breaking the insurance law. Pay those insurance premiums, keep your employees protected and protect yourself in the process. Landlord and tenant issues. Unfortunately, as fewer people become a receiving income or reduced income, they then can't pay their rent. And um, I know it's been asked in some of the press conferences, you know, what happens if I end up out on the street and the government is already starting to consider and address those sorts of issues. But think about it as well from your business point of view. If you have a lease of premises, uh, review that lease, see what it says about um, disasters and inability to access the premises and so forth. Um, make sure you are in a proper dialogue with your landlord um, about your ability or inability to pay your rent because the last thing you want to do is to come out of this and then find that your business premises have been taken back by your landlord. Contracts with third parties. Every business has contracts with third parties to make it function. Some businesses have many, many contracts. Dig them out, start reading them. Consider whether you can suspend or delay or give notice canceling liabilities that you may have under those contracts. Those contracts may not be as what we call in law frustrated by current events. So you may find yourself under an obligation to continue to purchase things that you have no need for. So look at the notice clauses and the termination provisions. Worse still, uh, and thinking very bleakly, what happens if you are a sole trader or the, the key guy that runs your business? What happens if you become sick or worse have you put in place the required legal documents to enable others to take over and run your business for you? So powers of attorney, um, have you made a will? Um, most lawyers don't seem to ever bother making wills, which is somewhat ironic, and they then tell all their clients that they should be making wills. Um, but now is not a bad time to sit back and contemplate your own mortality and to just think about, do you have the necessary things in place? And of course, in a world now where electronic signatures are widely accepted, get yourself set up with uh, the appropriate electronic means by which you can use and deploy electronic signatures for those people who will accept them. Um, and there's lots of other things happening out there whereby now um, 
it's possible, for example, to notarize documents without applying the seal and various bodies of government will now accept the document as notarized by a notary, even though the physical seal is not on the electronic document. So just things to think about um, by way of a sort of general roundup. Um, don't just think employment and immigration, think about your business in the round. And this is the team that hopefully, are, well, I know me and Nick are online because I can just see little pictures of me and Nick, um, but Hillary and Alistair should be out there as well amongst the uh, virtual audience. And I believe they may well have been answering some of the chat questions going along, but I haven't been able to see any of those until I terminate the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to terminate it now, um, throw the floor open um, for uh, trying to deal with questions the best we can. Um, and of course, being a lawyer, I have to put up the disclaimer and start and end up where I finished and just say, this is just all general stuff we've been telling you. It's no substitute for actually looking at the particular and real documents, the actual contracts and drafting specific documents. So please, um, whilst of course we want you, the whole purpose of this is so that you can, to a degree, rely on what we are saying. Um, as lawyers, we have to say you can't rely on what we're saying because we don't know your individual personal circumstances. So on that, point i'm now going to try and end this which yay there we go um and then figure out okay right um will do you uh, want to come on and officiate as it were in relation to more closely than I up to this point. Yes, uh, I think um, your team has done a lot of uh, good good responses to many of the questions, but I'm going to unmute everyone. And if anybody uh, has a question that you don't think has been answered, uh, please, please raise them now. I don't think your global unmute is going to work well. I think we have a mute up the electronic hand up one at a time at random. Yes, let's start again. Uh, let's raise your hand. <laughs> yes, I certainly couldn't hear a damn thing once that just happened. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yes. so every, everybody has obviously got real hands. They can wave on the screen. But I think it would be more effective if you use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen um, because that enables you to uh, put your hand up or clap or, or indicate uh, in some way using maybe the thumbs up, I want to speak. Okay? So that's how, we, that's how we're going to say we want to speak. And then mute, um, Will will then unmute you and will attempt to answer the question. I got a funny feeling that these yeah. thumbs up and these claps only appear on the screen for a few seconds and then disappear. Right. So I think we may have to try the good old fashioned, um, good I'm here and I want to ask a question, <laughs> Wade, okay? And then uh, that means you'll have to come on video, I'm afraid, so that we can see you doing that. And then we'll, we'll work on that process. I think um, Claudia Wang has a question that's in the chat. So if you can look through the questions on the chat, that may be good to respond to those as well. Okay, I can also see Omar waving. Yeah. But uh, if we can ask Hi. people to submit your questions in the chat, that'd be good. Yeah, hi, good morning. Okay, thanks Omar. Um, hi Will, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, the, the question I had in regards to the temporary layoff, um, up to day 29, 
I, I had a couple of my clients ask me about that and they wanted to know if it's cumulative or is it, you could lay off for one week, rehire for one week, lay off for one week, rehire for one week. What's your, what's your thoughts on well, that? Well, difficult, uh, difficult answer, Omar. I don't think it was ever intended to be used, as it were, on a back-to-back -back basis, whereby you lay off somebody for 10 days, you pay them for 10 days, you lay them off again for 10 days. I don't think that was ever the intent. Having said that, uh, as a lawyer reading the black letter of the law, it doesn't actually say you can't do that. So um, right. I, I would just urge caution that if you do take that approach, rather than entering into an agreement with your employee, you might run into some difficulties. The other thing is that we have put forward to government a very strong argument, we think, the 30 days in that section needs to be changed urgently to 90 or 120 days yes. to serve employment and health care at the minimum for employees uh, in this situation. Obviously, an employee, if they're subject to a layoff where they're only getting paid, uh, so they're only getting their health insurance and not paid, they can always resign if they have an opportunity for another job. But at least at the end of this, they still have a job. Right. Um, right. And what's strange is the law actually says that that 30 days can be read as six months, provided you are in the construction or agricultural business. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Right? So, so what it now needs to say is, uh, or any business adversely affected by COVID-19. I mean, four more words as an amendment to that section on an emergency basis yeah. would make a major difference and give employers another whole pile of tools that they can work with right and and even that it doesn't even necessarily have to stay COVID-19 but in the event of a pandemic or a yes, natural exactly. disaster yeah. no yeah uh, I mean we get hit do... with hurricanes right yeah. and that, that can present a similar situation exactly yeah. exactly thanks um, Omar. we got another question uh from Charlene I'm going to unmute you Charlene thank you hi Charlene Hi, thank you so much. Um, the information this morning has been absolutely brilliant, so thank you everyone. Um, however, I've got a really, really difficult situation. Um, I, I do have a small business and one of my employees, um, her permit is due to be renewed on the, I think it's the 18th of this month now, April. Nice. We had a conversation um, before, obviously we were told to close the business. And I said to her, obviously, we were going to continue with her employment. However, after the business has closed, I, I don't have extra funds. I work mm -hmm. basically from week to week, month to month. So, and I am a pretty high earner in my own business. Uh, so there's very, very, there's, there's no money coming in now. That's it. And I have no right. idea, obviously, when we're going to start again. So we had a conversation... <laughs> I can, I can um, say this, and unfortunately at the moment, the immigration department and government has not sought to introduce any relief in relation to work permit fees by either saying that they can be paid over a period of time yeah. or by reducing them or even waiving them. So at this yeah. moment in time, the only way you can renew the work permit is to pay the fee. Now, Okay. You can't afford to pay the fee. Yes, yeah, that's what I don't have. A terribly helpful answer. And I, I, I'll switch to Nick in, a, in just a sec. Can you, Will, can you unmute Nick as well, please? Um, but, I, but having said all of that, then you are then faced into the either doing the layoff regime or the redundancy or just entering into an agreement with your employee. But the problem you have is they have to have a work permit in order to work. Yeah. And more importantly, remain on the island. Well, that's the problem. And she, she lives in an extremely faraway country, um, mm -hmm. which now with the COVID going on, she cannot get to. Her mm -hmm. husband and child are in Jamaica. Um, she doesn't technically have a Jamaican passport. That's in process of being developed, I guess. 
So I don't know what advice to give her because I yeah. physically cannot monetary pay her permit. And well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, Nick? Yeah, if I might, my, my colleague Alistair, uh, who, who, who's watching on, on this, um, actually came up with a potential partial solution to this problem that works, we believe, legally, uh, although it, it requires a novel look at the Immigration Department's policies. There is, as we all know, a temporary work permit regime. And the fees for temporary work permits are substantially below those required yeah. for full work permits. Yeah. It yeah. therefore appears to be a possibility if an application for a say, work permit is submitted prior to the expiration of the existing work permit and the fee for the temporary work permit is offered it and proffered then it may be that there is at least an argument that the person can continue working by operation of law for the next three months even if that temporary work permit is not yet determined Many of these things are perhaps wishful thinking on our part. I'm sure that the work authority will be contemplating such as that. Yeah, so just, just to interject, I mean, if the person's trying to get a Jamaican passport, that's great. Um, obviously, at some point in time, I think it is reasonably foreseeable there will be one or more evacuation flights to Jamaica for Jamaican citizens and persons potentially married and to Jamaicans or dependents of Jamaicans, that yeah. would be for the Jamaican government. Obviously, the government has recognized there's a problem here in the sense that it's saying that expats out of work with no money can make an application through the needs assessment unit for food vouchers. Now, yeah. Obviously, you know, everyone depends on their individual circumstances. I certainly would not want to be in a situation where I can't pay my rent and yeah. I'm dependent on government for a food voucher. But many people are going to be in that reality very soon. Yeah. yeah. So do you think then that I could, because we were going through the papers and we were, she had almost completed her paperwork to renew a one year. But unfortunately, circumstances changed. So we had an agreement with each other that when we went back, supposedly on the 6th of April, that we would reassess, you know, the financial situation and make a decision then as to whether we were putting mm -hmm. in her permit or not. Well, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be back on the 6th of April. Um, um. And there's no money coming into the business and I don't have the funds. So do you think then I can go ahead and put in a three-month temp for her? Well, that's what's been, that's what Nick is suggesting. We okay. can't say for definite it will work. Okay. We think that a compassionate and flexible government ought to, and it's within the scope of the law, we think, grant it. Um, okay. But all we can do is say, make the application and reach out as best you can. And, and explain to immigration in my letter why I'm doing a three month and not exactly. one year. Because Absolutely. I mean, I've seen people coming in here now on the chat saying, you know, yes, I've always understood it wasn't possible to do a one year and a three month. Well, no, that's true. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's a case of, well, they may not have done it. And it may be that no one's ever challenged it. But we really don't want to be in an adversarial situation. We are looking for sensible solutions. Because yeah. people who are on this island on work permits um, are already resident and businesses need to be helped. And the, one yes. of the ways to help businesses is to allow temp, either temporary or shorter term work permits at reduced yes. fees. And all Do we can say is, I don't know who from government is listening to this or, any, or indeed whether anyone from government will listen to this, but you know, so. there are many things <laughs> that can be done to help. And all we can do is put them forward and hope that they are duly considered in their, in their fullest extent. Thanks, Charlene. Thank you so much. Next person that had their hand raised was Claudia Wang. I'm going to unmute your, your, your mic. 
Claudia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, just as uh, I ask, uh, I think it's a very simple one, but I just want to clarify because I really don't know. So we have a, like a few staff and then their permit is due, which is already expired on the end of March. But unfortunately, the office of work is closed. So what we should do, email their renew permit to their secretary of work or we just wait until, I don't know when, to renew their permit? Claudia, uh, I'll jump in to start with on this. I, I, my position on this is you should do everything you can to get those applications in as quickly as possible, even if it simply means providing the complete as possible scan of the documentation to the uh, work authorities at the work.ky uh, email address. Um, sorry, work at gov.ky. Uh, the, um, the the way forward, really, the law indicates that persons in that position are not entitled to continue working because they have not, in fact, applied for renewal of the work permit prior to the expiry. Yeah, and, there, and this would also impact what Charlene was saying. There's two other aspects to this. One is immigration have put out a very, very broad statement that things will have to be as per the status quo for the time being. Now, whether that is enough to say that you can go on working on a work permit whose renewal date has come and gone is very is questionable because the guidance is not clear. The other issue is, of course, that if you can't afford to pay the fee and you write in and you say, I want to renew the work permit and I'll pay the fee as soon as you come up with a methodology by which I can pay you, you are buying yourself some time. It's a bit like, well, I've put the check in the post situation and you can't even do that. Um, what we've been saying to clients is, well, use one of the agencies or law firms, deposit the money ver um, electronically into their account and let the law firm or the agency give their undertaking to immigration that they hold the fee and that on the approval of the permit and the mechanism being available to pay, that we are undertaking to pay. So the money is out of your hands and out of your control and in our bank account and we're giving an attorney's undertaking to them that the minute they tell us where to send it, we'll send it. And that way there can't be any question about renewing permits when people can't afford them. Okay, so if like we can afford the, the fee for their permit, so what we should do, like scan the check and send to the immigration? Yeah, I mean, all you can do is what Nick says, we do the best we can. Obviously, a scrupulous person could just tear it up and never send it to them. Okay, uh, where Whether I can they're find going to email trust you or not, that that's the best you could do in paying them. The moment it is, because there's no bank account information to submit fees to. And I would add, I think it's extremely important that you provide the fullest possible explanation as to why you are in this position to them uh, in order that they can properly consider all the parameters of, of their own deliberations. Well, the reason is the office is closed. <laughs> No, no, but the reason perhaps why you weren't able to reply, apply for the renewal electronically until after the date had already expired for the permit is what I think Nick's getting at. Oh, I see. Uh, well, because we find out like... Uh, we no, I mean, know. I, I think we all know why. I mean, I'm not asking you to justify it. I'm just saying you should put it in the letter. Okay, I see. So where I can find an email address to send to? I think if you just go on to the WOC website, the Cayman Islands Immigration website, you'll find, um, you need an email address, right? Yeah. Yeah. Please. So you're looking for an email address, Nick, it would just be the WOC general email address? Yes, I believe, but I ask everybody to please check and confirm that it's WORC dot gov, uh, at gov dot ky. Are there any other questions or anybody wants to put their hand up to ask a question so I can unmute your mic? I 
I think we stunned them all into silence. <laughs> I, either that or Alice and Hillary be doing such a good job in answering all the questions on the chat. Well, we have 10 more minutes on the chat unless somebody... I, I see a question from Robert Smith just glancing down. The idea of a suspension of an active work permit, again, that is something that we have put forward. Um, and if not in a suspension, an extension, um, yeah, automatically extend every work permit by three months um, by operation, by government order, um, rather than suspend it, which is complicated because some people won't need them necessarily suspended because they're part of the essential services and so forth. It's trying to find a way that makes it easy for government to help business, but doesn't make it difficult for government to actually implement is what we need to find solutions. I have a private question here that was sent to me. How does it work when the employee is laid off and fully compensated to that point for them to pay 100% of their health insurance? How can the company be obligated to provide health insurance when the payment obligation is for the employee. Right. The real issue here is what you mean by layoff. If you mean by redundancy, then we're talking about this three month requirement on the employer to continue to pay, to pay the health insurance, albeit with the ability to recover the premium from the employee. If we're talking about layoffs, we're in a different regime because in the layoff, the person remains an employee and the health insurance law says that they must continue the health insurance for the period of layoff, which is the 29 days under the section 42 provision. Again, if anybody wants to submit your question in writing, we can respond to it. Um, I see that the HSM has done a good job responding to many of the questions, so hopefully they're helpful. I got two more questions. I got somebody, Charlene has raised her hand again, so I'll unmute your mic. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, sorry, lots of questions. Um, in, the, in, the, in the event that my employee is not granted the three-month temporary extension um, due to financial problems, does anybody know whether there will be flights to Jamaica or any other help that I can advise her relieving the island? Well, the premier, the premier has announced during his regular press briefings that Cayman Airways may be considered yeah. uh, to put some of those flights on. So I think as, as the situation continues in our country, for this self-isolation and yeah. businesses are not allowed to open. I think the premier will probably get more requests and they may indeed add flights for Cayman Airways off the island. But you have to understand as well, the, the countries where these flights will go into will have to accept them. So again, yeah. just like we're doing self-isolation once, once people come in here from other countries like the UK, yeah, I understand. It was there's just, a, there, was, there was, sorry. sorry, there was nothing clear about any Cayman Airways flights going to any particular countries. So I guess it's just a waiting game, right? We just don't yes. know at this point. Yeah. And the government has to negotiate with each jurisdiction as to who they're yeah. going to allow to be on those flights. Um, there's one question. Thank you so from, much. Uh, Regina, can you lay off? resume work at day 30 and then make redundant somebody at the later sit, um, situ if the, if the COVID-19 situation doesn't resolve. And the answer to that is yes, you can. You can lay off somebody now for 29 days, bring them back on full pay for a period of time, and then determine that nothing's getting any better. You still don't have any work for them and then make them redundant. That is an entirely possible scenario. I see Madhavi has her hand up. I'm going to un unmute your mic, Madhavi. At least I tried to. <laughs> <laughs> Madhavi, are you there?
Um, just not able to, I'm trying to unmute the mic, but I can't seem, maybe you can do it on your end. Is that any better? That's better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Technology. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to just offer my own piece of advice. And I just think if everyone did what they thought was the right thing to do, and that's very individual, then things will work out. You know, um, look at the law, look at your employees, look at your situation financially and otherwise, and the environment. And you come up with your own system of what's the right thing to do. And things will work out, you know. You, you just put whatever it needs to put in action, whether it's a letter, a communication, um, a comforting word of advice or something, just information out to your employer or your employees. Just you develop, you know, from wherever we all stand as what is the right thing for you to do at this point. And the next step will happen. And something will work out. Thank you. And um, Dave Johnson asked a question, which I've just, my eyes just fell upon, which was, if you're in one of these extended layoffs, for example, in the construction or agricultural industry, uh, what was our view on the payment of health premiums during that period? And my view certainly is that you are, as an employer, obliged still to pay those health premiums during that period of layoff. Because the health insurance law, the test is employment and, res and or residency. Um, and uh, therefore, you would still be employed and you still would be resident in the Cayman Islands during that period. It'd be different if, in, as a result of the layoff, the employee in question nipped off island for four months. Um, that might have some immigration complications, but certainly they, during those four months, you wouldn't have to pay the health insurance premium. Ms. Vanjie Hunter has a question. Ms. Vanjie? Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, two questions, really. The first one is the 29 days you speak of for the layoff. Is that 29 calendar days or 29 working days? Calendar. Okay, all right. And the next question is, I think um, this was addressed before, but I wasn't really clear on the answer. If we have work permits that have come up for renewal or are coming up for renewal in April while work is closed and we want to renew those permits, what is in place for us to be able to do that? Um, Nick, do you want to answer that? Yes, yeah, yeah, so, uh, uh, I, I would say that for the time being, there is nothing confirmed and therefore it is our position that yes, everybody ought to do it to comply with the letter of the law as they always have. And that in this instance, at the moment with the knowledge that we have would include providing as full a renewal application as possible by email to the immigration authorities. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. Um, Jennifer was asking a couple of questions about specifically about the hotel industry. Um, interestingly, and we're in a fast moving environment, but on Monday I, I did a webinar very similar to this um, with the Cayman Islands Tourism Association uh, members and executive. And obviously they are, like many other businesses, very hard hit by this, the industry because there are no visitors. Uh, leaving aside the, the other restrictions that we're now all living with. But the bottom line is the hotel industry is no different than any other employee and no other industry. We're all subject to the same rules of the common law and at, in the statutes uh, that abide. Um, there are many, many employers who, without being unscrupulous, are simply just trying to do their best. And in trying to do their best, are breaking the law. Um, or breaching contracts, uh, not following the labor law. They are genuinely trying very hard to do their best. Um, so I'm hoping that we will see very relaxed enforcement. And But as lawyers, we just have to say to you, this is what the law says. This is what the law says you can do. And this is what the law says you can't do. Um, I see Charlene has put her hand up again. Let me unmute her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I, I just wanted to check if you guys were going to have any more meetings like this because they're really, really helpful. Absolutely. And after today, will you do it again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we're going to kind of speak to the members about what type of topics they really want to address. This webinar is going to, it's being broad, uh, broad, recorded and will be posted to the website. And obviously we work very closely with HSM for our legal assist programs at the chamber. So we'll be consulting with them to see what other legal assist uh, kind of webinars we can be hosting. Obviously, yeah, please, how they are. please send your ideas either into Will or directly to me uh, or to Alison Hay, for those of you who know her, who's our marketing manager. And we can certainly um, pull attorneys uh, in to do these sort of things uh, very easily because we know where they all are at home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, we're all at 11 o'clock, as we promised. Um, I see there are a couple more questions coming in now. Um, and I think HSM has done a good job responding to those. So I'd just like to thank you, uh, Nick, uh, Ms. Vanity, you there? Yes. You want to ask a question or? No, no, I think I just didn't disconnect. Thank you. Okay. No problem. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I'd like to say. All right. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you for your patience staying on, listening to me droning on for an hour or so. Uh, before we get to the, you know, the question, but uh, I say we're here to help, and uh, we're we're all struggling with this. So anything we can do to help, just shout. Well, can I ask one final question? Yes, yes. Um, what if we are in the process of terminating an employee, and um, they need to have their three months, or we need to pay for, make sure that they pay for their three months health insurance, mm -hmm. but their um, payment is not enough to cover those three months health insurance premiums. What do we do in that case? You're not going to like the answer, but here is the answer. Um, when you give them the termination letter and you set it out and you're basically going to end up saying you owe us money. And how do we go about claiming that? And the answer is ultimately you would have to bring proceedings in the summary court if you couldn't reach an agreement. But obviously if your employee is from overseas and they leave, that's going to make any attempt to collect that money very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe an economic if you have to use a lawyer to do it. But I say you, I knew you wouldn't like the answer, but that's the answer. And if you like what you're doing is you're, you're paying what you're out of pocket is really your insurance against ending up having to pay a million dollar health insurance claim. If I might just interject you on that point, that of course, if the person is from overseas and leaves the islands permanently at any time in that initial three months, the obligation to pay the health insurance in fact lapses. And yeah, so there yeah. may be a mechanism through that whereby, in fact, there may even be some money available to the employee concerned if they uh, are able to leave the island Somebody else asked a very good question, which I deliberately dodged noticing when I read it, because I understand entirely the practicality of our advice, or its impracticality. They said, well, how do I know if the person's left the island? Well, right now, you know for sure they haven't. Um, when those EVAC flights come on, um, you might have some comfort that they were on one of them. But at the end of the day, it's only communication with the employee and or trusting the information they give you, a copy of an airline ticket, or simply they're suddenly calling you from a different jurisdiction and saying, I'm now back in Jamaica. Um, it's common sense. Okay, well, if, if that's it, unless there's any other burning questions that want to be asked, I think, again, thanks to Hugh and Nick and the team at HSM for hosting this, uh, this webinar. And as I said, we're going to put this on our COVID uh, website that we've created just for this crisis. And please, we also ask you, if you have not signed up for our daily watch, which is an update that we send to our members and others in the business community, please send an email to communications 
at caymanchamber.ky and we'll be more than happy to add you to our list. Um, again, we're all in this together and hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to provide you with information that is useful to your businesses. And I wish each of your businesses, um, you know, to really take this information seriously that Hugh and Nick have provided. This is very serious in terms of the ability of your risk. Um, so if you do have employees that, you know, you need to advise at going forward, please take their, their advice very seriously. Um, don't let this linger. Uh, look at your business right now. And as, as they rightly pointed out, um, you know, if you do have serious concerns about going forward, as we all do, uh, take a look at all those contracts to make sure you're, you know what, what, what risks you're facing and take action, not, not next month or the month after, take it now. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Nick and Hugh. And thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the to the audience.